everyone. Uh, my name is Edwin Guarin. Uh, this is Chris Bowen. I'll let him introduce himself in a second. I just want to make a quick announcement. First of all, all UCS50 students get Windows 8 for free. So if you're thinking about actually you know, using it for your final project, it's yours. Um, Nate will send out an email later on for instructions. Second thing is, if you decide to uh, write a Windows 8 app for your um, CS final, uh, CS50 final project, we're going to be doing um, some giveaways. Uh, next box, we might be able to give a slate away, stuff like that. So, um, you know, if there's anything holding you back, let Chris or I know um, how we can help you uh, build something really cool. So, thanks again for coming today, and I'll hand it over to Chris. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I'm Chris Bowen. I'm one of Edwin's colleagues here in the Northeast. And I uh, just wanted to spend a little bit of time with you talking about how to make a Windows Store uh, application with HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS, and kind of get any questions you may have about it uh, answered for you uh, as you're looking toward thinking about maybe using it for a, a CS50 Finals uh, opportunity. And uh, that said, we'll just dive right in. I'll go over to slides over here. And if you do have any questions, feel free to send me an email. I'm cbowen at microsoft.com. And there's my blog and my Twitter, whatever, however you want to get in touch with me, that's fine. And uh, I've got about an hour of stuff, and I want to get your questions in uh, along the way. So <coughs> don't, uh, don't be shy about having questions during this. Uh, they can't see who's asking the questions on the recording. So you'll be as anonymous as you want to be there. So uh, let me dive right in, just give you a quick introduction to uh, Windows 8 and show you a few of the things about uh, Windows store apps that you might consider as you're uh, thinking about developing an application. So really, we're looking at Windows 8. We've been out for a couple of weeks now. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of strong adoption out there already. And uh, you may have seen uh, already the, uh, the Surface machines that we have as well. Uh, there's one over here, actually, you could take a look at if you're here in person. And I uh, really want to talk to you, show you around a little bit about Windows 8. And the idea with Windows 8, it really does bring forward all the stuff you know about Windows uh, into some new experiences. Uh, in particular, things like on the Surface machine with touch, uh, these kind of more mobile devices that are uh, now in market. Uh, but it's also Windows at its core. So it means you can install it really on anything that runs Windows 7. And that, you know, from your biggest triple SLI gaming rig down to your, uh, your laptop and to your, your shiny new uh, other devices that you might pick up uh, today, uh, it will run Windows 8. And so I'll show you around just a little bit. And all the experiences that you'll see here uh, are things that you can create. And the idea is you can, whether it's touch, mouse, keyboard, whatever the device is that you're running your, your application on, it's going to run great. Uh, Windows 8 will, will help with all those scenarios. And so uh, these slides aside, let's just get right into taking a look around here. Let me show you uh, around my home screen. This is my start screen, and uh, just give you a little bit of a tour here. I'm on a non-touch machine, so as much as I want to touch my laptop screen, it won't do a thing. So I'll just scroll around here a little bit and show you. Uh, so things you might notice are uh, the fact that these, what are called live tiles, actually can animate, and they can provide information to you. Uh, you know, maybe updates on statistics for a game, or show you news from some of the earlier apps that are here on the left-hand side. So um, there we go. I'm sure it's only positive and fantastically great news. Uh, but you can see here, it's really calling your attention back to the app, saying, hey, there's something new here. Take a look. Come back in and, and see what's new for you. Uh, that's called a live tile. And you can do notifications either right from the application itself, or uh, if you keep take a look in more details, you'll find out how to write a remote service that can actually push information to the tile, which is what's happening with these, these news apps. They're actually getting news from the cloud and updating the tile right there so people know there's, there's a reason to open up the application and take a look at whatever the latest news is uh, in any of these, or there's new recipes, or uh, a new high score to beat, or a friend playing, or whatever on these, these applications. It's something to entice you back in. So that's the live tiles. And it could be a person. It could be a website as well. Uh, usually, it's an application. And pretty much all of these things that I have here came from the Windows Store. And I'll launch that. It's one of the applications that you get by default uh, on any machine that's running Windows 8. Uh, so you can come here to find really anything you, you'd want, uh, from things that are highlighted to games that I haven't seen before. Oh, wow, we've got a new pinball here. And uh, so you can install these right here from the store. And we'll talk about how to develop these. So you have a lot of choices in how you create them. We'll focus in on the JavaScript story with HTML and CSS. But uh, to the user, to the purchaser of the app, it doesn't matter what it was written in. They can go ahead and, and work with it. I'm intrigued by this one, so I need to open this up and take a look. Uh, every app, uh, including the ones that you can submit and, and sell or give away for free, whatever you want to do in the store, uh, will get a home page like this. 
So you can submit with your application uh, a bunch of screenshots, and you see some here, uh, details about the application, and over time you'll accumulate both ratings, which are basically just the, the star rating, and reviews, which provide a little bit more insight. Actually, someone has to type something and tell you how awesome you are. And uh, that will go into your reviews section over here, um, which I haven't looked at, but uh, fantastic. Won't even open. <laughs> how great. Well, for the folks for whom this did open and run, they seem to really enjoy it. <laughs> but <laughs> keep this in mind. So uh, the internet, anyone can say what they want about your application. So make sure you're doing a great job with it. Make sure you're making it as comfortable for the user as you can, because they can, they're a couple clicks away from providing a review, uh, and that will accumulate up to your overall review rating. And you want to do your best, because you're going to be up against other applications. There'll be you know, thousands of apps already uh, in the store. And chances are there may be something that does <coughs> similar functionality to what you're doing. Uh, so if you can really stand out from the crowd, that's going to be to your advantage, of course. Uh, we'll get into the store a little bit later on. I really want to focus on creating apps. But the short version of the store is worldwide distribution. It's automatically part of Windows 8. People just fire it up and take a look at various apps here. Uh, you know, the dress up sticker book and all kinds of <laughs> various apps. Actually, Fresh Paint, I use this a lot. Um, Poorly, but I use it a lot. And um, it's showing me I already own it. So let me show you something I, I don't have. Um, I guess you videos, I don't have that. It's brand new. You see here it's free, so you can install it right from the store. You have choices too. You can, of course, uh, give it away. You can put advertising in the app or game. You can also uh, charge for it. Uh, and you can very easily provide a trial for the application as well. So you can let folks try it for a week, whatever you want to do. That's just um, customizable through the portal. You don't write any code for that. Uh, so you say you can use this for a week and then you've got to buy it, or you could do things like you could play the first three levels of this game and then you've got to purchase to access the rest. And you can even do in-app purchases as well, so you can say uh, we've got additional uh, adventures or, or sets of graphics or things that are unlocked, more recipes that are unlocked if you purchase these extended sets, and you can do that all within the, uh, the app or game itself. So totally up to you, your choice. There's a lot of things that you can do in the store. Um, and then basically you're submitting it to uh, a certification channel. We could talk all about that a little bit later on, but uh, that's, this is the goal. You want to, uh, to get your app worldwide visibility in the store uh, here. And back on the start menu here, the start screen, I can show you around a little bit more. Um, if I launch these apps, um, let me give you an example of uh, some cross-app functionality here. To do that, I'll launch Fresh Paint. Now, one thing you'll see here is every single bit of the screen, all pixels of the screen go to your app. There's really kind of gone are the days where you have these borders around windows with lots of buttons that are always there taking up space all the time. Now you really want to get away from that and just have you know, your content be the focus. And we can do things with Windows by accessing other kinds of menus. So one of them is actually what's called the Charms Bar. And it comes out from the side of the screen. You can actually flick from the side if you have a touch screen. Or you could right click if you have a mouse. There's a keyboard shortcut for it. There's always more than one way to do something uh, in the environment here. Uh, but that brings out uh, a number of things that you can do. The most obvious is you can go back to the start screen. But the other four are what are called uh, charms. They're contracts that you can plug into as an app developer. And they're, they're pretty cool. So search, I'm sure you can guess what that's going to do. Sharing, I'll show you in a second. Um, and devices and settings, these are all things that your app can plug into to leverage Windows to say, I've done my part, and I want Windows to uh, support some other functionality, and I don't want to write a lot of code to make that happen. So that's really a benefit of using these features. Let me show you one. And to do that, uh, I'll make a new painting. I also talked about using every pixel for your app. So by default, this is what the Paint app looks like when you're using it. It's really just about whatever you're drawing, your content. Right? So I could do horrible things here. I, I f I'll, what should I draw? I don't know. Scribbles? Oh, great, I can do scribbles. Fantastic, a turkey. You expect that? <laughs> this is the most abstract turkey you will see. So I can also bring up what's called the app bar. And this is really one of the key ways that you can use to hide away all the stuff that might have been on your, your app or game before, or just taking up space all the time. So now you can put it up here. And this is really one of the more beautiful experiences uh, with app bars that I've seen. Put the choices here for selecting different colors. Uh, we wanted a turkey, so I don't know, I'll put some brown here. Start mixing in a couple colors, and we'll take an intermediate color here. And then get back here, you can start drawing. There's your turkey, fantastic. 
I can't draw to begin with, but to do it with a touchpad in front of an audience is even better. This is awesome. So the idea, though, is <laughs> everything that I care about is right here on the surface. Now, let's say I'm so satisfied with this that I've got to share it with somebody. Uh, normally, what you do with other versions of Windows, you maybe take a screenshot, you do some copy-paste of your text or things like that that you want to share out, and then go and open up another application and put it into it. Here, you don't have to do that. You can actually bring out the charms bar and say, I want to share this. And at this point, it's going to show you all the apps that know how to work with whatever is being shared. In this case, it's a picture. So it's going to say here, OK, I see you've got a picture. Do you want to share that? And you can see I've, I email myself stuff all the time. I, so it recognizes that. And uh, it's offering me that as a shortcut. But it's also showing me every app that knows how to deal with uh, taking a picture and doing something with it. And these have all indicated to Windows that they can do that. So at this point, this is Windows. Uh, the user just chooses what they want to do with it. Uh, I'll do my, my usual of Puzzle Touch. You can see I've created all kinds of puzzles over time here. I'll take Puzzle Touch and say, I want to share this amazing creation with Puzzle Touch. And it's going to go ahead and say, OK, great. Uh, you want to share this? Fantastic. Do you want to make a puzzle that's easy, intermediate, whatever? I'll make an intermediate one here. It makes the puzzle. It's going to be a terrible puzzle because <laughs> it's mostly blank. But it's ready, and it's actually back in the other application. So if I come out here, I can search for it and launch it. And now, if we scroll over just a little bit here, we should see my creation somewhere. Where did I go? What kind of puzzle did I make? Did I make it easy? Oh, there it is, right there. <laughs> it's the easily recognizable turkey puzzle uh, that's here. So, but the thing I want to point out to you is, you know, the, the cool thing here is the apps didn't know anything about each other. They only said, I've got a picture to share, and I know how to deal with pictures. And you, as a developer, you don't have to write that code. You just say, when someone asks me to share, I'm going to put some data into this little data structure, and I'm done. The other app takes over, does its thing, and that's the end of the sharing experience. So that's just one thing that you can do, uh, really, really powerful. And it's going to be one of those things that could really help differentiate your app, and also your game, too, in the store. So people are going to be able to say, this is really useful. I use this puzzle creator all the time. It's fantastic. So um, all right, that's about enough of a brief overview of what's going on here. There's a couple other features, too, that maybe we'll highlight as we go through code. But I want to dive into slides. And to do that, I'm going to go to desktop, which is itself another, uh, another live tile here. I can go into this. And sure enough, I'm on my slides. But let me show you ac actually where we are. We're actually in desktop mode. And so this is really where what I was saying before about Windows carrying forward to new experiences shows itself. This is the Windows you know. And so Windows uh, applications are called desktop apps. They run here. If you have existing apps and you want to run them on Windows 8, you can absolutely do that. These are not the same things as the store apps, which are over here, like Fresh Paint and these NBC News apps and things like that. <coughs> Those will come from the store. They can plug into some of the features that I was showing you and others that I haven't shown you just yet. Uh, but just to keep that in mind, we, we have support for both of these things as well. And oh, I'm sorry, is something not showing on the screen? I have lost it completely. Where? That's odd. OK, thanks for pointing that out. OK, so what you haven't been seeing for a while is my showing you that the desktop is here. <laughs> when, when was the last thing you saw? Did you see this? So this is the desktop. You already know what it looks like. Uh, it's nothing uh, terribly unusual. It's our carrying that experience forward for you and letting you use the things that you've had uh, and for example, I'll be showing you Visual Studio. Uh, that is a desktop application. It's going to run in this mode. It's going to support you know, a very more complex environment with a lot of options and things like that. So it makes it a really a, a, good op a good option as a desktop app. So that said, let's go to slides for just a little bit and give you some introductory content and then get into actually coding here. The good news is I've heard you've been focusing on a lot of CSS and JavaScript HTML. Uh, all those things that you've been learning carry directly into making Windows Store apps. So uh, the things you've been hearing about with applying you know, CSS selectors and all those things is ex exactly what you do to create an application here for the store. So we'll go through these things bit by bit. But uh, uh, basically, I'm building on the stuff that you already have taken the time to learn. So this is the overall chart of the technologies that you could use to make applications for Windows 8. The stuff on the right, the desktop apps, that's really what we already know. That's stuff that is really the Windows 7 world carried forward into Windows 8. All of those options carry forward, uh, you know, C Sharp, VB, Win32 kind of development. Great, no problem. The new stuff is on the left-hand side. That's Windows Store apps. That's when I want to get my application wired into Windows 8 using all those features, get it into the store, and get that, that really cool experience uh, 
of the Windows Store applications. To do that, you can see here, you've got all your choices um, uh, with XAML, C++, C Sharp, VB, you can do DirectX, things like that, uh, things that go beyond the slide. But for us, we're going to focus right in on the fact that HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are really a first-class citizen for making applications for Windows 8 and for the Windows Store. So, this is good for everyone here and folks watching on the video because you can just leverage all those experiences that you have and, and really tie into what Windows offers. And you're going to do that through a set of APIs. Uh, we have, it should be no surprise, every OS has its own APIs. We expose what Windows can do uh, through what's called WinRT. That's a set of APIs um, that just does everything for you. You need to open files, you need to use uh, the camera, uh, geolocation, things like that. They go through um, what Windows can offer to you. And to access that, you also have, we have some more JavaScript that's going to make it even easier for you to do that. We'll get to that in a moment. But for now, that's basically your roadmap. The things that you've already been doing on top of some APIs that help you work with Windows equals store app. And that's really about all you have to, to know from the high level. We'll dive into actually working with this stuff uh, now. So the things you've probably already seen a bunch of, uh, with IE9, um, a little while back, we introduced support for a lot of the, at the time, you know, newer standards in the web. So a lot of new CSS features, a lot of new HTML, uh, ECMAScript 5, which is really JavaScript. Uh, so everything for that except for strict mode was in IE9. Uh, just a ton of stuff with CSS, CSS3, uh, all in there. And all this stuff carries forward into what we're doing with Windows 8. So you can use these things. And you can use everything that's new in IE 10. So with IE 10, we introduce support for all of these things as well. Uh, and they're all hardware accelerated. So you're on a machine that has some kind of GPU, uh, which is probably pretty much every machine that you could get in the past eight years. Uh, you're going to be able to have hardware accelerated uh, output, what, you know, visual output with CSS, uh, Canvas, SVG. All those things will go through hardware acceleration and be that much faster, more efficient. Uh, and the short version of all of this, I'm not going to go through every single thing here. Uh, if you see it on this list, if you can do it in IE10, if it's a web app that you're running that works in IE10, it's something you can do as a Windows Store app. And that's pretty much it. So if it works in IE10, it's going to work as a Windows Store app. And so it's, it's on the table as something that you could use. Uh, so there's a lot here. It, we don't have till midnight, so I can't really review everything here. But uh, there are some sites that will help you, you know, understand what these things can do. And I'll show you one of them in a second, but just wanted to point out a few of the key things that you might look at. Um, maybe you've already seen some of these in your studies, but uh, these are really helpful in particular with Windows Store apps um, from the CSS side. So being able to do uh, transforms and transitions, uh, provide motion with animation, these are all part of CSS now. And they're all supported by you know, modern browsers and IE10, IE9 have added support uh, over the time for all these things. And so why write it yourself? Why go through all the trouble of doing these things by hand when you could use a, a simple CSS transform to create a 3D effect for your application? Great. That's how it works. I can't make it any more difficult than that. It's really, if you know how to do it in CSS, you know how to do it in the Windows Store app. And going beyond that for layout, things like, um, like even like the Store app, but going beyond that and looking at maybe a news app that's showing you articles or recipes or things like that, these other kinds of features in CSS are really useful. Uh, grid, Flexbox, uh, CSS regions, it's more of a fairly new standard uh, as well. And these things are all going to help you lay out content and flow content between sections, uh, being able to do pagination and hyphenation without you having to write the stuff yourself. You just say, please do the following for me. And as the screen, you know, real estate is different on different machines or as you're, you'll see in a moment as you snap an application to have smaller amounts of space on the screen, uh, that's no problem for CSS. It can take advantage of, uh, we'll talk about media queries in a second. It can take care of things with uh, repositioning your content, flowing content from regions, just with these, these things that you may have already seen uh, with web technology. On the HTML5 side, there is also a bunch of things, there are also a bunch of things that will be very helpful for you with Windows Store apps. And again, we won't go through all of these, but uh, they're just here. So if you need to use it, uh, you know, audio, video, if you want to do validation from forms, uh, geolocation, all the things you can do in JavaScript uh, with JavaScript 5 or ECMAScript 5, IndexedDB for local storage, these are all options for you. So if you're looking for an answer, just look to existing technologies with HTML5 and CSS, and you'll find easier answers than having to roll a lot of that stuff yourself. So let me show you around a little bit here. I've got a site we can go to, and uh, let me quit out of this slide for a second. 
And if we go out to the IE test drive dot com, I, I won't do much of a demo here. IE test drive dot com is really showing you a lot of what's uh, new with IE 10, the things that you can do. And I find this is really useful because instead of reading through a bunch of white papers, look at a few demos and that's going to help you put it on your own personal radar about whether a technology makes sense to even do any more research with. Um, so you'll understand, oh, I see what this is for. I understand uh, you know, request animation frame does for me. I understand how I could use regions or uh, uh, you know, SVG filters. Uh, you see them in action, see them on an example here, and decide for yourself uh, if that's going to be useful for you in your own projects and beyond as you continue to work with web technology. So uh, here, I would just encourage you to take a look. I don't think I'll spend much time actually running these. We've got enough to show with writing code. Uh, but you'll see here things from touch effects to touch-based games, uh, in that section, uh, animation, really fast hardware accelerated animation with there, uh, some, op some, op uh, excuse me, some optimizations that you'll see in some of these samples as well. And there's just many, many more. If you go over here and open up the site map, there's just a ridiculous number of samples here. So you can see them all here. If you're looking at something or you heard about something and you're wondering, well, maybe this would be something cool to use in the app, try looking here and there's probably a pretty good demo for it. Uh, to save yourself some time. Okay. Any questions so far for folks here? Decent. Okay. We'll carry on here. So again, just check that out. And you know, they are web standards, so go to any other showcase sites that you know of um, and see if those technologies make sense for what you're trying to do. Okay, back to slides. Okay, um, that said, you are moving from a web world to really an installed local application world. So there's some things to point out here. First of all, there's no web server involved here. There's no Apache, there's no IIS running here serving up pages to a remote client, to a remote browser agent. Um, in this case, it's really everything's packaged up for you. You submit that as your application to the store. It gets certified, it's out in the store, and then people by the thousands will install your game or your app, right? And, but basically, they're pulling it down locally to their machine. There's no need to go out to the web anymore unless you have calls that need a remote API. That's perfectly normal as well, too. But they're not going to be in that mode where they have to go res request response from a server to get the next page of their content. So that said, there's a few minor API differences. These are incredibly minor. They're, they're unlikely to hit you in your normal coding, but they're at least documented. Uh, they're kind of edge cases there. And um, the other thing worth pointing out is the trust differences. I only mention this because uh, I just want to make sure you, you knew I said it. So if you run into it later, you'll, you'll think, Chris said something about this. So maybe, yeah, OK, and go back and you find out what it was. Contexts matter. So by default, we try to protect the user uh, from you know, vectors of attack. And so there's certain things that you can do by default and certain things you need to change context to enable. So as you're using some libraries out there, you, you've already been working with jQuery. Uh, but if you look for other libraries out there, you might be using some functionality that kind of goes beyond, uh, like local usage does more dynamic interactions, XHR requests, things like that. Sometimes you might find those will be disabled by default. And in that case, just do a search, look for local and web context, and you'll find out how to fix that. Just make sure you knew about that as you begin to use other frameworks, which I should mention, you're perfectly able to do. So if you find some other framework, we'll talk about this in a second too, like for gaming and you want to use that, uh, you want to use some control libraries that are out there and you don't want to write that stuff yourself, it's a good idea, right? Uh, you can absolutely use this stuff. This is, there's nothing holding you back from using uh, any kind of library that's based on JavaScript, CSS, HTML5. Again, if it's something that you can do in IE10, which is a heck of a lot these days, you can do it. And so pull it into your app reference that JavaScript library and use it in your application. Uh, just keeping in mind, you might hit a security context once in a while, not very often. Um, and then the features, we'll go over a few more of those as we go. The UX, you'll kind of get used to as you see more and more applications uh, from the Windows Store. You get a feel for, a feel for how they work and how uh, the design aesthetic really tends to work across different applications and what people will be used to experiencing. And that's really the important part. Make sure that when they fire up your app, they don't need to read a manual, which they never do, by the way. And they should just be able to start playing with your application and figuring it out uh, without much difficulty. And by sticking and adhering to a lot of these practices, you're going to do your, your users a big uh, favor, making that easier. Okay, 
One last thing on the API side, and then we'll get into actually writing code. WinJS is that thing I mentioned very briefly with that complex slide with all those different choices that you have for making applications. Uh, WinJS is really, you can think of it as a buddy. It's your friend to help you <laughs> write stuff more quickly. It's just JavaScript and CSS. You don't have to use it. You can use it. Uh, if you're going to be calling into Windows features, you, you will end up using it. But if there's things like uh, some design patterns or controls that you really don't want to use, you want to use something else, it's up to you. Decide what you want to use and the styles that you want to use, the features from like namespacing and class generation, up to you. So if you prefer one or the other, it's entirely your choice. It's still JavaScript and CSS. But it's going to help you do a lot of stuff. Um, so for example, here's a subset of what it can do. Um, things like helping asynchronous programming with promises. Any of you uh, heard of or work with Node, like Node.js? Uh, this is a, a, it's, a, it's a common pattern to work with asynchronous programming. Um, so basically what you're saying is go do something and you're going to give me a promise that you'll return to me when you're done. It's essentially what's going on. Uh, so you don't freeze up your application while the user is going and picking a file or something is being streamed down from the web. The UI remains responsive. And you can do that by using asynchronous programming. And it sounds ridiculously complex, but it's really easy because you're using promises. And you just say, go do this, and when you're done, call back to this method. And that's pretty much it. That's all built into WinJS. It's going to make it a lot easier to write uh, really uh, flexible and powerful applications. You can see the rest here. Uh, a lot of animations. Probably one of the more important things on this slide uh, are controls. I have a, I think I have a whole, yep, I do. Here's an example of just some of the controls that you can use in your applications. This is all straight up from WinJS. So you aren't writing these yourselves. You just say, OK, here's how I want to compose my application. I'll, I'll use a flip view so I can go between different pictures. Or um, I haven't shown you a semantic zoom. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, list views, there's grid views. You've already seen a grid as part of the store application. <coughs> so being able to use blocks of content and scrolling across that. Uh, Flyout menus, you'll see from time to time. Uh, the app bar, I showed you with that fresh paint application as well. So you saw how you can customize that by putting buttons on it and having that hide away when you don't care to use that. So that's, that's really totally up to you to use. Uh, these are all controls that are part of WinJS. I'll show you how to make these in just a second, but there's more than just this. And the key thing is use them if you want, save some time. If you have other control libraries that you'd like to use, that's perfectly fine too. Uh, things like jQuery UI uh, as well does a lot of, of this kind of idea as well, providing more controls that extend what you can do in HTML and JavaScript. Okay. <coughs> so let's dive in. I've already said that. Use what you'd like. Just keep in mind that you might run into some context issues. Um, but you can certainly mix in and match whatever kind of libraries you, you're comfortable with, you want to learn, you want to use to save yourself some time. So let's talk about tools just for a second. Um, you can get what you need to begin working with Windows Store apps. Uh, if I go back, I have too many things up here. If you go to this page, which is uh, dev.windows.com, uh, you can download everything you need. Uh, as students, you have access to, to more than uh, the general public does. So you can get higher end versions of Visual Studio. Uh, Edwin mentioned you can already get Windows as well. Uh, but in general, for all developers, you can go to this site and download really everything you need to make an application, and it's all free. So there are free versions of Visual Studio. Uh, there's some tools that will install alongside of that. Uh, everything you need to create and test your application. It's only when you're going to publish your application up to the store that you're going to need a developer account. Uh, this, too, I believe is free. For, is it free for students as well? The developer account, yes. the actual submission. So that's another good news. So you'll go look at this. It'll say for an individual, it's by default, it's $49. But uh, don't sign up for that as a student. Uh, we'll get you some information through your programs that you can get an account for free. Uh, and that will let you then submit your applications right up to the store, as many as you like. And, and all of that goodness will soon follow. So that's dev.windows.com. Uh, you can, again, download the tools that you might need from here. Um, and if you want, you can get a, a trial version of Windows here. But again, you won't need to. So uh, the other site, let me point this one out for you quickly, is design.windows.com. That was dev.windows.com, design.windows.com. You can guess what it's for. It's actually a pretty friendly site. There's a lot of good information here. You can work through it. It's going to give you some advice on uh, some things that maybe you haven't thought about before or had to deal with before, like designing for touch, designing for different uh, form factors, uh, designing for the capabilities of Windows 8. 
uh, the things I mentioned before, like searching and sharing, uh, some things that I haven't talked about yet. Uh, they're all listed here. And it's, it's a pretty good uh, set of, of helpful file uh, uh, pages that will help you understand how to make a certain kind of application, how to do interaction, how to deal with uh, the UI and UX uh, of your application. So I would recommend that you take a look at this, especially if you are uh, at some point ready to uh, publish or you're, you're hoping to publish an application to the store. You're going to want to know how to make a good application, as I mentioned before. If you don't, there's those reviews again. People are going to be unhappy. They won't be able to find things that they expect in the right places. And, uh, well, no one wants that to happen to you. So, moving ahead here, let me close that down. Now that you know where to get things, I will show you how to actually start using stuff. So to begin, I will actually show you here uh, an example of desktop apps on my start screen. So here, uh, you can see Visual Studio, you can see Blend and other developer tools that I have here. They have a slightly different tile. That's because they are desktop apps. And in those cases, they're all going to launch back to my desktop and really just as apps that you've already, you're used to. So Windows experience, it's the same thing. Uh, so they are not like, uh, for example, like Armed or, or these things. If I, let me launch one quickly. Actually, here's an interesting one. This was developed by students uh, over working in partnership at, at Nerd. So full screen application, you know, these kinds of experiences here. Oh, nice cut screens and all kinds of fun stuff. But they <laughs> developed this. <laughs> Might as well show the whole thing while we're at it. And in fact, I worked with them a little bit. I gave them some advice uh, on things because they were doing JavaScript for their application. Uh, <laughs> Please, I'm not taking credit for their work. They did all the work. I just <laughs> they, uh, gave them a little bit of advice here, from here and there. Uh, so, but they've done some great stuff by using a JavaScript front end and you know, tying in some physics engines and things to make a lot of this work. Uh, so really cool. Oh, gee, I don't know. I just did. Go. We'll see if that works. Oh, wow, it still worked. All right, good. But you get the idea. So a full screen app, really good experience. Uh, this is supporting not only my mouse and and pen, if I things like that, but also touch. If I had a touch screen, I could just draw onto it and, um, and continue working with that. Um, one thing I didn't show, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, is I wanted to have another app to show you what you can do with. Um, you can actually take applications in Windows and drag them to the side of the screen. And what happens, this is called snapping an application. And so in this case, I've, I've taken Incarus and I've added it to the side here. Uh, it is now in snap view, and that allows me to do something else while that application is there. Most games you'll find will just simply pause. And that's normally a, a decent thing to do, unless your game can somehow scale down to that small of a resolution, like maybe some kind of board games, things like that on occasion. But in general, it's the easiest thing to do and the most appropriate thing to do for games is to pause the application. For applications like um, news, news apps, so over here, if I launch this one and then I snap it, you'll see it actually changes significantly in how it's uh, presenting the data to you. So here it's showing you uh, in really a more vertical pan that information, but I can still absolutely uh, use the application. So it's still very useful. Uh, the fact that it's in a smaller view doesn't keep me from using that app. So think about that. It's something that you need to have your apps do to some degree, uh, but it's up to you to determine how functional your app should be in that kind of a, a smaller environment. Okay, so let me close that one down and oh, let's go back into where we were here. Edwin, you added a photo of me already? Yeah. Look at that. See that? Edwin added a photo. Uh, so <laughs> uh, let's go back over here into Visual Studio. Let me launch this for you. So uh, again, I could have clicked on the tile on that start screen. It brought me back into desktop mode and it's launching the desktop app of Visual Studio. And this is Windows that you already know. So I can go ahead and create a project here. We'll focus again on JavaScript and HTML. So I'm going to go out and select up here under JavaScript, Windows Store. There's a number of templates that you can use. Uh, for productivity, I would recommend you take a look at some of these other ones here, like the grid and the split. They're really useful if you're making an application that's going to have that kind of design and navigation. And you'll see these a lot. Like the one I just showed you was actually uh, an instance of the grid application. So if you think you're going to be making like a news app or an RSS reader or something like that that deals with multiple entries that you want to show the detail for, uh, for which you'd like to show the detail, think about using one of these templates to get started quickly and customizing it from there. But just so I can show you all the moving parts here, I'm going to create the blank app, and then we'll, we'll go a little bit more deeper 
uh, into the details here. So I'm just making that blank application here. It's going to create the whole project for me. I'll open up the things that I want to show you by default. Let me just zoom in a little bit to show you uh, what's created for us here. So the things that you're going to look at first are all named default. So you're going to look for default HTML, <coughs> default JS, and default CSS. The other thing to point out is that we already have a reference to what I mentioned before. Uh, this is WinJS. No one actually calls it this long name here, but uh, it is WinJS, the Windows library for JavaScript. And if you open it up, you can see it's all in here. There's different CSS files. There's JavaScript. Again, it's there to help you out. It's really there to, to provide controls and styles and stuff that you can just use automatically. Uh, but again, if there's things you want to use instead uh, in terms of styling and other controls, entirely up to you. But I will show you how to use a couple of those things right now. Now back over onto our left-hand side. Let me show you the default HTML page. Uh, you've already seen the WinJS stuff, and that's really all that's going on there with those middle uh, lines of, of markup. Just bringing in the CSS by default and bringing in a couple of JavaScript files from WinJS. You don't need to be master of what's going on inside those files. It's pretty interesting to take a look at them to kind of review what's going on in there. It's they're pretty interesting uh, intermediate and advanced techniques going on in there. But the nice thing is, as developers, you can just take advantage of them, just use them, and not really have to worry about it. You can still drive a car without having to know how it works, right? So that's the kind of thing that's going on here. Uh, there's controls and the styles and stuff that you can just go ahead and use, uh, and code that you can use uh, in a second without having to, to know what's in there. Here are your own files. So these are your places that you can modify your own CSS and your own JavaScript to get things rolling. Uh, you'll be adding certainly other JavaScript files and other, perhaps other CSS files as your project grows, but this is really just a starting point. And here is the, the hello world equivalent of HTML, right? So we're back in the body tag. At the top, by the way, I didn't point out, it's the HTML5 doc type. So you'll recognize that from what you've been working on as well. There's full IntelliSense in here as well. So if you do things like um, I type in a video tag and expand that out, you've probably learned about the fact that you need, um, you need to do fallback encoding for video tags in HTML5, or maybe you have, uh, to ensure that different browsers support uh, have support for your video. Uh, we have things like this for, you know, across HTML, across JavaScript, across CSS. Uh, so that's built in, and I'll show you CSS in a second. But here, you can go ahead and start modifying code, uh, the markup. In fact, I'll, before I change anything, I'm going to run this and just show you what you get. You're going to get a splash screen, which you can customize that, and then you get the hello world <laughs> experience here. Uh, it's fantastic, right? It's, you go ahead and ship that, right? So content goes here. That's, that's the, uh, the basic thing. Uh, can only get better from there, right? So we'll go ahead and add in some stuff. Now, I've got a little bit of markup. I'm going to copy in here, just so you don't have to watch me typing. And let me go bring up the toolbox here. And I'll pin this, because I'll be doing this a few times. Toolbox, if you haven't seen Visual Studio, is where you're going to find a bunch of controls and things that you can, you can also put code snippets into it that you can reuse. Uh, so here, I'll just pop in uh, some other HTML. Nothing terribly advanced at all here. <laughs> it's just basic HTML saying, you know, uh, I have an input where I can type, I have a button where I could submit it, and then I have a div that's essentially a placeholder that I can use to output the hello, you know, you type this. This is the, you know, it's the, the intro to HTML example, right? Uh, so if I run this, uh, now we automatically get, you know, we get the HTML, but we also automatically get styling. This is the important thing, uh, one of the important things from WinJS. It's going to give you, by default, uh, some look and feel that is really kind of consistent with the rest of what Windows 8 is doing. So here, you see things like the button. The button, by default, in HTML doesn't look like that, but it does here because it's getting that CSS right from uh, that CSS file in WinJS. Do you f do you, if you want to use something else, if you want to change that, totally fine. Go ahead and do what you'd like. But that's the default. It's going to be more familiar to users. Um, and of course, this won't do anything. So I didn't actually wire up any kind of code to respond to that. It was just the HTML. So I can get rid of that. And we'll come back into our application. And let me switch over to our default JS. This looks <coughs> pretty complex, but it's just doing a few things for you. That's and it's boilerplate. It's going to be the same in all your projects. So the only thing this is doing is just kind of asking, how did I get here? And saying, are you launching this app for the first time? Are you resuming the app from having it being suspended? A uh, couple of things like that. Uh, really, our, our focus on this screen, on this uh, file here, is right about here. At this point, this one line of code 
is pretty important. It's actually going to go and look through all of your markup, and it's going to find things that you've asked to um, have turned into controls. So um, deeper controls, like a rating control, like a grid view, like the flyout, and those other things that I showed you on that slide before. They're not native HTML controls. You just don't say flyout in an HTML you know, uh, as an element and have it know what to do. What we actually do is the same thing that happens in other kinds of control frameworks, like uh, jQuery, to jQuery UI does the same kind of general approach. You use, you use markings in your HTML, and then some JavaScript comes through later and says, oh, I know what that is. That's asking for this to be turned into this stuff, which is other more expressive HTML to make like a ratings control, which is what I'll show you right now. But this line of code uh, is a promise that's saying when this promise is fulfilled, then everything that you've asked for has then been created. And that's it. It looks a little complex, but uh, it's really the same in every project. So it's down here is where you can start adding in you know, whatever else you want to have happen here. So we'll come back to that in a sec. First of all, I need a bit of code that can respond to the fact that someone's clicked on the button. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in down here. <coughs> Again, I'm not going to do any typing in front of you here. Uh, very basic JavaScript, um, just saying when this is called, we're going to be provided some details about how we got here. And then we're going to do a few basic things. Go find the thing in my HTML page that is named name input. Grab it, take its value, slap hello on front of it, and stick that uh, resulting string into that div tag that we had before that really didn't have anything before. Uh, now we're going to find that tag and make its inner content equal to that string. Very simple JavaScript. Hopefully you're recognizing that there's really nothing unusual going on here. It's just straight up HTML and JS here. So uh, if I run this now, it's still not going to do any work because I haven't wired it up uh, to receive the event. And to do that, I'll do that right here. Again, returning to my toolbox, popping it in here. And hopefully, I expect you've, you've seen all this kind of stuff before, so I won't ex over explain it. Uh, now we're going to go get the hello button. We're going to say, uh, button, congratulations, here's an event that you now are responding to. When someone clicks on you, call this function, the button click handler. And that's that function we just added right down at the bottom there. That's it. So now we've got an amazingly functional application. I think uh, you'll be really impressed by this. Chris, uh, wait for it. Wow. OK. It's not, that's amazing. So <laughs> but, but there's more. So <laughs> don't, don't buy it yet. Wait. Uh, let me show you a little bit more here and get out of full screen. Uh, we're going to walk before we run, right? So let me go in and actually show you a little bit with CSS. And just by default, um, if we look back at the page here, remember we pulled in these things from WinJS and we got the UI dark. In fact, you could change it to the default for using light applications. Dark, UI dark is good for graphic applications, like you're using like a lot of pictures, you're showing a lot of visual uh, content. If you're showing a lot of textual content, the light UI is, is more, is generally a, a good choice. You don't have to choose it, but I've switched to it, and now you're seeing the same markup, same everything. It's just using basically an inverted scheme here where everything is, is making it uh, uh, black text on white. So that's all well and good. Let me get out of here, and let's actually do a little bit more with the CSS. I'll put it back on dark, because I think it's probably easier to see on the screen when I start doing these things. So um, I'm going to replace the body one more time. So let's go here. Let me nuke this. And let's bring in the body with classes. And I believe you've done, you've done basic selectors with CSS and things like that uh, already. So you, you probably know what's going on here. Um, just assigning some, some classes to our header. And we're creating a new div to wrap the rest of that stuff that we can now use to style uh, all together. So what I can do now is go over to our default CSS. Have you looked at media queries yet? Have you talked about that at all? So media queries are part of this, um, this emergent trend, or it's an established trend now actually on the web for uh, responsive design, adaptive. And the idea is that your applications can really adjust themselves appropriately based on what the device that they're being shown on can do. So if you're on a mobile device, obviously you're not going to have as much screen real estate as you will on a big 30-inch monitor sitting with a desktop, you know, with a big PC like that. So the old answer to that would be to have like five, six different versions of the same page, and you'd open up the, the version that was tuned for that certain size screen. Not great. 
uh, it's very, very repetitive and just a ton of maintenance to do that. Now we have something called CSS media queries and we can use this to automatically detect when there's certain sizes or certain uses of your content uh, being performed. And so you can respond to that and you can say, okay, well in this case, uh, you probably don't even need me to tell you what's going on here. Uh, this is just saying, if this application is snapped, like I showed you before, grabbing it and putting it to the side of the screen, then let's do the following styling. Styling is not just about colors and stuff like that. It's also about sizing and margins and paddings and uh, orientations of content or even disabling or enabling entire parts of your, your page, and in this case, your app or your game as well. So here, you can do you know, as simple as you want. You can, so I can say, now you <laughs> this wouldn't be useful <laughs> in your, your apps, but uh, hey, it's, it's demo time, right? So let me go ahead and just add in basic body uh, selector and say, hey, when I'm snapped, let's go ahead and do um, background color and let's choose something. Now you've got IntelliSense here. This is actually really cool. In 2012, we've added a lot of things for CSS support and JavaScript and HTML. Uh, you've of course got drop down IntelliSense too, but that's not the cool thing. The cool thing is you've got visu visual selectors for a lot of things as well. So you can go through and just choose a color or you can go out and be even more specific. You can choose uh, well, this is going to be terrible. Actually, pick a decent color here. And oh, watch, watch the markup, too, by the way. That's your RGB standard format there. But if I switch the opacity, it's going to switch over to an alpha channel selector here. So you can see that, the color with the, uh, essentially the percent transparency that you have for that, all baked right in there. So I'm going to keep it as 100%. And then when I'm done with that, all is well and good. Now if I run the app, and we take the app and we snap it, that background color is being adjusted automatically just because we have some CSS that says, go do that. Okay? You also can write JavaScript, too, that will do the same thing uh, or that you could use to actually you know, uh, uh, pause a game, uh, sh do things like that. That's probably when you would use JavaScript. You would turn off the game loop at that point. You would need some JavaScript because that wouldn't be something you would use CSS for. But keep it in mind, it's, it's just an event. You could say, when my application is resized, let's see if we're snapped. That's it. Okay. I've been talking a lot. Are there questions so far? On where we are? Yeah. Is there like a tutorial for like anyone using Yeah. The uh, question is uh, is there a tutorial for this? So I'll just extend it to everything. So, a few things that you can go to. And let's actually get out of here. Um, let me go back out here. So, one thing to point out is Visual Studio itself has tutorials built in. Uh, so, if let me get rid of this. Um, if you go and create a new project, so file new project, and look on the left hand side, there's an online node in this selector. <coughs> it's going to take a little bit. I'm uh, on my MyFi here. But uh, it's going to come up, it's going to give me a chance to find templates, but also, more importantly, samples as well. So I can click on JavaScript. It's going to find samples for me. My resolution is way high here, but normally you'd see a list of a lot of different things here. Um, and so if there's something you're you want to try, pick the language, JavaScript here, and say, I don't know how to do geolocation. I don't know how to open a file. I don't know how to uh, take advantage of the webcam or optimize for touch or things like that. There are samples for everything, sharing, searching, uh, app bars, uh, making remote calls to a service, JSON encoding, all those kinds of things. There are samples for here, and they're not huge samples that are going to take you all night to kind of pull apart just to find that one thing you wanted to learn. They're really good. They're, they're small, right to the point uh, kinds of samples. And I, I've learned a ton by going through these myself. And so I recommend that a lot uh, as one thing. Uh, the other thing to point out too um, is, of course, you, I showed you dev.windows.com. Uh, so if you go back to that, um, you'll see at the bottom here, there's also the samples here. So you can download all of them at once. But there's also uh, a lot of other resources here too that can help you get up to speed. One other thing, and I would really recommend that you try this. Um, I've got it on my blog, but I'll, sh I'll just go right to it. Um, yeah, I'll show you. So my blog has resources and things like that, but one of the things to point out is um, right here, this thing, your idea, your app, 30 days. If you click on this, it's going to bring you to um, a really helpful site. This isn't. <laughs> this is much more helpful than you might expect. Uh, this is going to be 30 days of content that you can basically get tips and tricks throughout that process um, as you're creating an app. 
And as you may not expect, you can actually get it for games too. So, and for phone apps, things like that. So basically sign up for it and they're going to be sending you tips and tricks on, have you thought about doing this? Do you support Snap? Here's some guidelines on how to do that well. Have you thought about uh, you know, submitting to the store? Have you thought about how you're going to sell your application? It's going to walk through all these various things. And actually, if you're on the gaming track at some point, you'll start recognizing the person talking to you because I actually had to go to Redmond to do those and <laughs> recorded two videos there. But uh, that's all part of the gaming track. And uh, there's also a full track for general app development. But that's called Generation App. Uh, would definitely recommend that to you as well. In addition to the samples, uh, there's a lot of videos on a site called Channel 9 as well. And that's probably the last thing I'll recommend as well. Um, before we move on here. But channel9.msdn.com. Uh, this is great because, again, you're not going to be reading through tons of white papers. It's basically a lot of, of videos, uh, you know, screencasts and things that are right to the point. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it's always right to the point. It depends who's doing the talking. But uh, generally, there's some really, you know, to the point videos here that'll show you, you know, some particular thing you might want to learn or see demoed, whatever. There's also all of our content from our conference that happened a couple weeks ago. Uh, called Build, and you'll see that, oh, actually right there, there's eight core technologies, uh, core technologies for Windows 8 games. There you go. I was there, actually. You can't see me. I was over here. But uh, anyhow, that aside, <laughs> I would recommend that you take a look at those videos. Uh, they're pretty helpful, so if you are stuck on something, you just want to see what something could do, fire those up. All right. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Edwin. All right, good. So, um, oh, yeah. Please. Is oh, I'm glad you asked that. Yes, the question was, is there a, a visual interface for me to create things? Edwin will reward you handsomely for that question. Uh, so, <laughs> there, there is a way to do this, and I'll... Should we do it now? Let's do it now. So, I'm going to go to it right now. Um, I was actually, let me add in one more thing to this demo, and then I'll show you the actual answer. So go back to our, oh, I was going to add in a little more CSS here. I was a little off on, uh, on tangents here. So let me put in some CSS here to take advantage of our new, um, the classes that we added a little while ago, uh, to the header, to the main content div, and then to the greeting output. If I do that and run it, you can see now we've got a little bit different padding and margins. Uh, so we've actually some offsets here. These are more toward what you're going to expect of a, of a final polished application. But I'm just showing this to you because it's straight up CSS. So the things that you already know, you can use here to adjust the content as you wish. You've already seen how to make the background uh, change out that way. And if I go back out to our HTML, I'm going to add in one more set of markup. And this is actually going to be a control from WinJS. So I'm going to go and grab this, a label, make sure I'm doing it in the right place. Probably good enough. So here, I've just added, and I will go full screen so you can see the whole thing. I've added a label for the next div. The div is called rating control div. By itself, it will do nothing. If you open this in a browser, you'd be looking at blank, the div itself. Um, but because of that mysterious line of code that I showed you before, the process all, it's going to look for something that looks like this, data dash win control. And it's going to find whatever's in those uh, in that parameter, it's going to find an instance. It's going to make an instance of whatever that is it's pointing to. In this case, it's a rating control. So I'm saying, please go and replace this thing with whatever you need to do to make a rating control. It could be a flip control. It could be uh, the progress ring or whatever control you want to use. They're all going to work essentially the same way. You're using standard HTML5 markup to indicate what you want, and then you're going to get a, a control at the end of this. So let me run this. I just copy that in, and now. That markup becomes this, which um, is actually quite a number of HTML elements. These are all individual images, and there's dibs around them with selectors. Uh, so now I can actually, hopefully you can see that. It's a little subtle. But I can hover over the different items, and it's going to allow me to see you know, the rating here. I can click on it, and it remembers the rating, but that's about it. It's not really doing anything with the rating. So the one last thing I want to show you on this before we switch into a more visual design experience is a little bit of code that I can use to respond to these WinJS controls. So let me get out of there. Back out of full screen. 
and switch over to, to uh, JS here for a second here. And I can do this right here. I think I'll replace this whole thing. S actually, I think I'll replace all of it, but we'll find out together. So I'll put this in here. Yep, I'm going to delete this too. What did I add? Looks like a lot. It's not a lot. Um, I just extended that, that line of code that I already talked about before. And I'm saying, when everything's done, when all my controls have been made, then do this. So then run this function called completed. And in this case, this is stuff you can figure out. Go find that div control. Uh, the one, well actually, one thing I should point out, that next line is actually saying, okay, I've got that rating div control, uh, control div. I want to talk to it as if it were a, c a real control, a, a WinJS control. So basically, you're asking for that from it. You're saying, I want to talk to you as a control. And then you can start saying things like, we're going to add a listener for you, so when you're changed, uh, we can respond to that. And then we can also do things like this. Uh, well, actually, that's the old code there. I think I am missing pasting in one more function, and that would be the actual function that would respond to the rating control being changed. Let me pop that in right down here. Somewhere around there. Okay. And in this case, the only thing that's new is the fact that we're going into uh, what the rating control tells us, and we're asking for what's called the tentative rating. Uh, there's a bunch of different other things that that control can tell you, and it goes control by control. You, it's very straightforward. You'll, you'll be able to figure out in no trouble whatsoever. So I run this, and now when I change the ratings and hit, and actually click on the rating, you can see now it's actually responding to it. It's putting that rating on the screen uh, into that empty, otherwise empty div tag below the uh, rating control. That's the magic of a lot of stuff here, too. So as you're creating applications for the Windows Store, there's a ton of controls that you can just use. They all work like this. Okay. All right, let me show you the visual side of, of designing for uh, these applications. And the good news is you've already got, you'll already have this tool when you install uh, everything. If you go to that uh, download and you get Visual Studio. So I can right-click on this, and I won't zoom in. It just says Open in Blend. Blend is another tool that works side, you know, side by side with Visual Studio, and it's focused uh, much more on the design side of things. So it really surfaces tools that are optimized for creating styles, creating animations, working with CSS, uh, a lot of things in, in that kind of vein. So here, what should be very interesting and pretty obvious immediately is we're looking at the app. So up here, hopefully we still are, uh, Instead of seeing code, which we still do see at the bottom, we're seeing the actual representation of the application. What's more, it's not just a representation of the app, it is actually the app running. And that's what really is nice about Blend. Uh, the team has done a lot of work to bring HTML and JavaScript and CSS into this tool. Um, and now you can actually, if you're curious, what does that mean? What can I do? I can actually design to this application, even though things like this don't exist in my markup. Remember that rating control? It was just a div tag. This stuff, that star, only exists at runtime. How do I know that? Well, there's a little bit of magic over here. See these lightning bolts? Anytime you see a lightning bolt, that means it was created by something at runtime. Some JavaScript ran and turned something into this, uh, or created this uh, with some logic. So tho those stars that you see there uh, were created by JavaScript, by WinJS. And the nice thing is, it doesn't matter to me, I can still design it. I can still go in and change it. I can find out what's going on here. I can look at the CSS. I can go ahead and find out like, why, why the color is the way it is. I can start messing with things and making things horrible. Uh, you know, whatever I want to do. Uh, actually, I'll leave things alone. Uh, but you can see here, it's all the CSS, and it's showing you here. Um, if I go up to there, it's going to show you really everything that's what they call winning. So the, the CSS rules that are the most specific and the most selected for that item, which you've probably already gone over in your classes, right? Um, where you can say, you know, there's a general font that we're applying to everything, but because this is an H1 and I have a color defined for H1s, it's going to be this color, and that's because it's more specific than the body one. That's this one thing right here shows you all of that. And it's really powerful stuff as you get more complex. You're wondering like why these things are the way they are. It'll actually tell you. And you can pick any of these items here. Um, that color is not too bad, actually. We can, and you can select them. Hopefully, you can see this. 
but for every, every thing that you have on your application, you see a whole cascade of all the CSS that could have applied to that and which one is winning, which one actually took precedence. So these are kind of boring. There's not a lot going on in some of these. If I go and change the color, then you'll start seeing some cascading there. But you can also use HTML here as well. So I can go through and modify the HTML properties for all of these things as I wish. And there's just tons of stuff here. I don't want to take your time by going through every <laughs> everything here. Just know it's here. And there's a lot of design-oriented functionality that's just available for you. So you can stay visual, work with the application, and not have to do a lot of guessing that you would have to do normally. Uh, and cycling back from a browser back into your design, back to the browser. That's really cool stuff for that. And as you develop a Windows Store app, it's going to make you a lot more productive. Um, you'll also see it's tracking uh, the, the, the stuff, the, the markup here, and your CSS as you're working through different things. It's probably really hard for you to see that, uh, especially on video. But um, that's what's going on here, and I would recommend yeah, just become familiar with that. It'll save you a lot of time. Uh, again, that's blended. If you make any changes here, they're automatically going to carry back over to Visual Studio. So it's the same files, it's the same everything. Um, eh, I'll leave it alone. I have a better example that I want to show you. But if I made a change there and saved it and I came back to Visual Studio, it would say, hey, you just changed something. Can I reload it for you? Yes. And you're using the same stuff there. OK, so that's the end of that particular sample. I want to show you a higher end sample um, just to give you a view of what else could, you know, other functionality you might think about as well. This is a, a sample app that you can download if um, you look for something called the Windows Camp in a Box. There are some samples that are in that, and one of them is the uh, Contoso Cookbook. I can just run this for you. Uh, custom splash screen. This is the grid view application. They've, they've bound some custom data here. And uh, now you can navigate through this. You can go and take a look at various things that will make us hungry on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I don't know. What is going to make me the most hungry? Uh, I don't know. I'm just going to pick one. You go into these things, it'll show you a recipe. You could also, instead of clicking on an item, you can go right to that, that category of content, that, that section of content. In this case, you can read lots of fake Latin telling you all about these recipes here, and then go right into the specific recipe here. This also supports things like the sharing that I showed you before uh, with the pictures. Uh, you can also uh, search into this application, too. It's very straightforward to, to do searching. Uh, basically, just getting a, a string of text from Windows, and you decide how you want to handle search with that. It's a few lines of code uh, to get that, and then what you do with it after that is totally up to you. Um, here, they also have an app bar where they're using some other functionality that I, I'll just tell you what it is. So, a reminder is going to use what's called a toast notification. Uh, this is really handy for like letting the user know when things have happened, like an application was installed or something was completed. Uh, also good for games, too, if you have a persistent world or a leaderboard and uh, a service that's hosting that, maybe out on a separate machine. Uh, those notifications can be sent into a machine. And even if the user's not using your game, playing your game or running your app, they can still get notifications about those kinds of events. So you could say, like, your castle's been destroyed or it's just about destroyed. You know, get back here and defend it or something like that. And you click on the, no the uh, notification, you go right back into the game and you can play it. So those kinds of things can help really uh, draw people back into your, your app uh, pretty effectively. There's also support in this application for uh, using the microphone, the webcam, doing video, and, and taking photos. Um, you can also pin a secondary tile. Uh, it's useful if you want to just have a tile that goes right to certain content. In this case, it goes right to this recipe. Uh, everything I'm mentioning, I'm just showing because it's things that you can think about using as well. And for the most part, they are very straightforward to use. I would just recommend you bring up that sample explorer and find a sample that can show you how to do that. And it's pretty straightforward to, to bring those into your apps there as well. Now, I was going to show you something else that's pretty cool here. I have now, I'll, I'll snap this application. I'm going to go back to Visual Studio. Now, this application is running. It's running from Visual Studio. I can do some pretty cool stuff with that. I actually have an option to select an element. And I can go over here to the live application. And I can say, well, I'm wondering, why is preparation time a little bit lighter gray than the title itself? I can click on it. It's going to synchronize that back into Visual Studio. And it's going to show me exactly the generated content that resulted in that part of the UI. 
So in this case, it's an item subtitle, it's an H4 level construct, and that probably tells us what we need to know because as an H4 within that context, it's going to get a certain kind of font. But if I still don't know why, I can click on Trace Styles, I can then expand out color, and I can find out exactly why that color is not the body color, but in fact is something else. And this is essentially the dev tools from Internet Explorer uh, to a degree brought into Visual Studio. If you've worked with like the Chrome dev tools, Firebug, things like that, those kinds of tools that are in the browser, that kind of functionality has been brought right into Visual Studio, so you don't actually have to launch you know, a browser and, and work with those tools separately. So now I have a, a Windows Store app just running, and I can start pulling it apart and finding out why uh, things are doing what they are. I can also do it this way, too. Um, I can go and just pick something right from the markup and find out what it is on the right the, uh, in the application itself. I think I've gone by everything. So here, I'm, I'm hovering over this. I can select it. It's going to show me in the actual running application where that thing is that I'm now clicking on in the, in the markup. It's so really cool stuff. So as you're trying to figure out what's going on and what HTML is doing what, what CSS is doing what, keep this in mind. Remember, this is here for you. Uh, and also that blend can work with a, a live running application. The one last thing I wanted to show you with this application, um, by the way, it shows you deltas as things change too. So you can watch for those yellow highlights. Those are things that have just changed in the application. Okay, but one last thing. I want to go back to blend just for a second here. And we'll open this up. Open and blend, same app, same everything. And just want to show you, it, the experience here isn't just, you know, you're stuck on the home page, kind of looking at the, the things you'll get by default when you run the app and, and let it sit there. You can also turn on this pretty small icon up here. It's called interactive mode. You click on that, it's going to bring up your application. You're not in design mode anymore, so you're not going to be clicking on things to change functionality. But you can actually work with the application now. So you can click through, you can do whatever, get to a recipe that you care about, and or to a category, let's go to this category. And I'll say, okay, here, here's where I want to design. Then you click that button again, it'll bring you back into the design surface, and now you can do all those things that I was talking about before. Like, I'll keep clicking until I get this selected, find out its dimensions, find out the HTML for it, the CSS for it, uh, for a running application, uh, some later part of the application. Very, very useful. So I just I'll show this to you. Please keep it in mind if you're looking into writing code with this, because uh, it's going to save you a lot of hassle, and it's pretty good stuff. So that's pretty much I want, all I want to show you on Blend and in Visual Studio uh, for all of that. Any questions on either of those tools? Anything at all? That's tough to get at, so good question, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've already shown you my demos here. So I'm going to put it on the resources page and turn to questions now. So that, that first reference is that generation app site with uh, the game track and the app track. Uh, sign up for those, um, and you don't have to wait the 30 days to get the content. You can start going and, and looking at the content as you wish. So I understand your time frames might be different than... Uh <laughs> so when is the hackathon? That's a couple weeks, right? So you don't have the 30 days to wait. So, so yeah, go, you can sign up for that and then just start pulling the content out from it. Also the dev and the design centers. And I didn't mention this, but there's also the store docs. This will be for after the hackathon, uh, as you're ready to start submitting your apps for the store. There's some helpful guidelines here, uh, some guidance about how to get things into the store, some common issues that might trip you up. Uh, and that's the end of those resources. So what's on your mind? Anything else that you're... I was thinking about doing a Windows 8 app for CS50. Cool. Cool. Oh, great. Um, any questions about the stuff that you've seen so far and how it relates to this? Um, for example, if with more time, I can take a game that I have written and it runs in browser and just kind of go through the process of bringing that into Visual Studio and making it a Windows Store app. It takes more time than we really had to include today. But the short version is it's the same code that you have running in the browser and the things that you change are the things that you decide to plug into Windows 8. So if you want to use charms, if you want to uh, you know, search or share, you, you need to create an app bar to hide away some functionality onto that. Those are the kinds of things that you would change. But the core of your web app can remain intact. Again, as long as it works in IE 10, it's going to be a really easy port to bring that stuff into Visual Studio, into Blend, and make it a Windows Store app. Uh, again, the only things you got to learn that you will need to learn are those other features that you can use to light up an application, like a, a live tile and those kinds of things. So, yeah. 
Right. My question is about um, working mobile. So if you make an app on that works as an app on desktop, is it really easy to transfer into mobile, or is there other? The question is, um, if I make a, a, a Windows Store app that's really optimized for this environment, and I want to bring it to a mobile world, what's, what's involved with doing that? Uh, that's, that, like many questions, are always a constantly changing answer. Uh, <laughs> the good news is, if, you've already, if you're sticking with you know, HTML and JavaScript, CSS, that's going to let you, if you're starting from a Windows Store app, it's going to let you bring it to the web and then use those kinds of, of techniques, uh, like media queries and things, to adapt to different size devices. That said, there's always frameworks and things out there that support extending out uh, different technologies, different platforms. That changes all the time. Um, we are also changing things as well as we look toward you know, what we have now actually out with Windows Phone 8. Um, we have some shared core infrastructures uh, offered between applications for those environments. So the stuff that you're doing to create a Windows Store app, um, a lot of that can carry over into a Windows Phone 8 application as well. Um, that again, it's an emerging story, so there's some content about that at Build. Um, the SDK just got out a little while ago, just, it was just released a little while ago. Um, but in terms of other platforms too, there are, again, you've probably run into many cross-platform frameworks as well. The good news is the stuff that you're doing here, uh, the, the core functionality is straight up stand web standard stuff. The only things that wouldn't translate easily are the things that Windows 8 does, but that's no surprise because it's a Windows feature. Uh, you know, you're not going to find sharing or, or you know, similar kinds of contracts on every other platform, right? So those are the things that you would want to, as, uh, from a design perspective, make sure you have ways to kind of abstract that out. Mm -hmm. So you can say, if I'm running on this, I can do that. If I'm not, we'll find a way to, there's some design patterns you can use to kind of hide that stuff away. But keep it in mind. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. Go ahead. Uh, if I actually want to test my Windows app on a tablet or a Windows phone, oh, yeah. where are you getting I skipped uh, a couple, uh, one more thing too, yeah. But I'll answer your question first and I'll show you a feature I forgot to mention. Uh, so we do have some machines uh, available locally. I'm sorry, the question was how do I test things on uh, devices if I don't happen to have a whole lot of things to choose from? Oh, we, uh, we lent you guys, I think, five or six. How many need? We yeah, we got four of them. Okay, you guys got four slates to play around with. So definitely yeah, let everyone know, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, that's even better answer than I was going to give you because we have office hours for developers that we do at our office, and now coming soon to the Windows to the Microsoft Store over at the Pru. But Edwin's already taken care of you, so there are four slates available for loaning for testing. Uh, there we go. There's an example of one up there. Um, so yeah, absolutely great. Um, now if you don't, I would. Absolutely, by far the best way to test it is to be on a device. If you don't happen to have one yet or you don't want to walk across campus in the snow to grab one or whatever, uh, there is a way to do this back in Visual Studio. So if I go back into uh, where I was here, um, doesn't matter what I'm on. So here, uh, yeah, you can still see that. Instead of using a local machine, you could connect to a remote machine, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Simulator is the thing that you might want to look into. I'll run this. And really what it is, it's a, essentially it's a window onto your own system. So here is actually my system running, running Contoso, but in a way that lets me change some of the execution parameters, so uh, the environmental parameters. So I can say here, uh, you know what? Uh, oh, I already had it running in a simulated 27-inch monitor at 2560 resolution. I can easily drop that down and see what my application would do with a smaller screen or by changing DPI settings or whatever, so on the smallest screen, on 10.6, what is it going to do? Oh, that still looks pretty good, right? You'll want to do this. You'll, uh, especially if you're submitting to the store, because we do, <laughs> it's part of the testing process. And uh, if there are problems like that, then you might run into an issue getting certified for the store. Uh, but that's, that's part of the simulator. Really cool, just very easy to do that. You can also use features like um, rotating it as well. So I can click the button here, have it rotate, see what someone would have as an experience rotating their slate, their tablet, uh, and using your application with that. Um, there's some other things too, like touch emulation and some other things, uh, setting, a, setting GPS. So like I can pretend I'm in a different location, see what my application does when I pretend that I'm wherever, back in Seattle or something. Uh, but it's a really useful uh, uh, feature, and uh, it's built into both Visual Studio and in Blend. Okay. 
Yes, your question. If you're writing a game, does Visual Studio have any support for like animation? Yeah, um, the question's, question is around animation support, uh, particularly with gaming. Uh, so it depends. <laughs> There's, uh, with, with JavaScript, I will say there's probably less support than there is on the XAML side, which has uh, timelines, has storyboards and things that are built in. Um, for animations on JavaScript apps, um, I don't know how much of an answer I want to give you. I have resources on my blog that go through a lot of options for both um, physics uh, animations, uh, options for, for JavaScript oriented games on Windows 8. Um, I would refer you to those. Basically, it's it's choosing, there's so many choices, the reason I'm hesitating, because there's so many choices for doing animations with JavaScript. It could be CSS, it could be canvas-based, it could be uh, you know, just basic DOM animations. It could be a lot of different things. So it really depends on your choice. If you've used something, if you decide to use something like uh, CreateJS or um, uh, Lime or other kinds of frameworks, uh, well, I'm not even sure you're going to be able to use a higher end framework like Impact or Construct. Uh, that, that tends to generate more, co more code uh, than, than uh, you might consider from scratch. Uh, so, but in those cases, you could still use a simulator, you can use the environments, uh, and I tend to just use this environment for my test platform uh, you know, in those cases. As I'm developing games, I've been fine, especially with canvas animations, which is probably the most common thing. The best you're gonna probably find is the, the dev tools in the browser and the dev tools in Visual Studio. I have a meandering answer there, but hopefully I got your answer. Yes, you and yeah. yeah. What are the data storage options for Windows 8 apps, Windows Store apps? Um, your your options really are: each application gets its own pool of local storage for settings and for data, uh, but it's also ridiculously easy to use roaming storage, to use cloud-based storage. It's free, and what happens is you basically choose a different class and you say uh, roaming settings save uh, this particular uh, set of content, and their Microsoft account, whatever they've signed in as, is gonna be the key to roaming that information around. So if I use your game on my laptop, and then I log in with the same account, and I play the game on uh, you know, a Surface or a tablet, that will automatically roam that setting and, and data between those machines. Uh, so that's, that's a default thing. That's good for certain amounts of data. Uh, you wouldn't put a huge database into those. Uh, for that, you need to go to other kinds of solutions like a hosted database uh, in the cloud, things like that. There's some other community options around other kinds of data technologies. I've seen some SQLite uh, options in the community around there too. So more and more are emerging, but those are the primary things that you would look toward for a game or an app. And you had a question in the back too? Yeah, it's kind of related, like, um, in terms of network activity, like yeah. um, uploading or downloading files or yeah. like, after your app was on like, Skyrim or something. Uh, is your question, how can you see that, or how can you debug that and test it? Um, or like how, how can you debug it and also kind of integrate it into the Oh, sorry, I can't hear all of it, so. Oh, like how do you yeah, debug, test it, and also like integrate it? Great, great. great. Um, so yeah, so how do you work with networking? Uh, how can you see what's going on? Uh, there's many different answers to this one, but uh, let me show you uh, probably the easiest things here. Let me get rid of the simulator for a second. And um, just a couple of debugging options for networking. There's a full network stack baked right into both you know, the WinRT level and from WinJS. So you can very easily make XHR, AJAX type calls from your game or app uh, to do that. Um, primarily, I tend to use uh, two things. I use the actual dev tools um, themselves, which have like a network stack baked into them. So let me show you like um, the Windows homepage. I can bring this up and there's actually a network proxy baked into, into these tools here. So I can do this, I can refresh the page, and it's gonna show me all the interactions, including AJAX calls for that, for that session, for that request uh, uh, duration. And this is useful, this can be very useful for browser-based apps. Uh, for other kinds of apps, including Windows Store apps, I use a, a, a tool called Fiddler, and uh, you're gonna get a game in response. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, but Fiddler is a simple proxy. I think I can show that to you. It's just getfiddler.com, which I 
interestingly enough, I'm tracing my network stack going to get Fiddler. Uh, but anyhow, uh, Fiddler has been written by one of the PMs on the IE team, so he knows what he's doing. Uh, so this is a good proxy that you can use for debugging network traffic. Uh, I would recommend that. Question over there, too. Is there an easy way to integrate uh, foreign language input, like Japanese or Chinese, into one of the I can't say I've done too much of it myself, but it is baked in. Um, there are options for, of course, uh, emitting your application, I'm sorry, I didn't say the question, uh, options around globalization, localization of content, uh, including things like uh, being able to sell in different markets uh, and target that version of your application for those individual uh, languages and cultures, things like that. Absolutely built in, we've had support for that for forever, and that carries forward into your options for Windows Store. Uh, you can do that in the store itself, sell in different markets. You can do that in the application as well, too, with using resources to define if I am developed for this culture, uh, then use these, these overrides for my textual content, uh, or use a right to map, a right to left uh, reader. Those are all uh, part of the default WinJS and WinRT APIs. So, good question. How are we doing? Anyone else? And if anyone on video has questions, I'm C. Bowen at Microsoft, so I'm happy to take any of your questions uh, from the future. Very. From the future, future. Uh, so here, me, here is me. Let me put back my contact here. So just send me a note, C. Bowen at Microsoft, and uh, I will get back to you as soon as I can. And anything else that you're wondering? We good? Great. All right. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.